You're listening to Restaurants Reinvented, a podcast for restaurant brands who want to put growth back on the menu. In each episode, Jen Kern, the CMO of Q, highlights innovators and change agents in the restaurant industry and uncovers how leading brands are modernizing their operations to drive efficiency and meet the evolving demands of guests. Let's get started. And welcome back to Restaurants Reinvented. This is Jen Kern, your hostess. And today I have Rachel Nemeth with me. She is the CEO and co-founder of a very interesting technology company called Opus. I can't wait to hear more about this company. But on the website, it says mobile training for the deskless employees, which I was like, ooh, that sounds really interesting. And so Rachel and I got a chance to meet at a conference recently. And I was like, I got to get this woman on the show because number one topic that keeps coming up, one of the top ones, there's several, but when it comes to culture and labor and employee retention is employee training. So welcome to the show, Rachel. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, really, really excited, excited to talk to you. So let's just start out with this, this big question that's been lurking in my mind. I think Lauren Fernandez had said it the best, which is, Employee training has been one of the biggest misses in our industry. And not just training, but the mentoring, the coaching, and the educating our employees. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to know from you, as someone who's definitely, I've seen an expert in training as well as in hospitality, what areas have we really missed on when it comes to employee training in restaurants and why? So it's a great question, and you're right. Um, it has been a big miss. I would say that it's largely, you know, it's it's important for restaurants to be thinking about, but it's not for a lack of trying, right? If you mm -hmm. talk to any operator, they're going to tell you that they are doing employee training. The challenge is how do you train a distributed workforce? How do you train people across six shifts? Some are part-time, some are full-time, 100 locations, you name it. Maybe you have a commissary, you have four languages you need to support. So think about that. <laughs> Plus there's kids and commutes and all of these other factors. So when we think about training, we have to really be thinking about how can I get consistent knowledge out to my team? That's the core problem that you're solving for in order to solve the business problem of higher output, right? What we've always fundamentally believed that what's led to these struggles is access. <clears throat> access to good technology that can help get this knowledge to your front line. And so I think we're entering, I know, because we're seeing it at Opus, we're entering a new era where businesses are rethinking the delivery mechanism through which they train their team because it's a need to have. You have to make sure that your team is consistently training on your brand, on your safety procedures and protocols, on leadership skills, what have you. And that has to start with better technology and better distribution. Okay. Okay. So access is really something that you just hit on and and providing that access to this distributed workforce and yeah. people that are very distracted, doing a lot of different jobs when they're actually in the restaurant. Talk to me more about that. I mean, mm -hmm. we obviously aren't about like putting the blame on restaurants here. Like, oh, you've missed it because you haven't tried. Like you said, yeah. the intentions are there. They're trying to do it. But until now, are you saying they haven't had the proper tools to do it? It's the proper tools and also the proper pedagogy, right? Like we're an instructional design team at Opus, right? Like that's, I worked in restaurants for 15 years. I was an instructional designer for 10. I have a background in second language acquisition. And so um, I've sort of seen both sides of this. And there's a lot of factors that aren't being taken into account when it comes to thinking about training. You had mentioned, so let's talk about both sides of it. The first is just the planned training. There's a lot of different categories, but I'm going to talk about planned and then I'm going to talk about responsive. The planned training is the like, we need to get everybody up to speed on the new menu, or we just hired 300 people for this restaurant opening. We need everyone to get into one space for six hours so we, we can train them on X, Y, and Z. We're doing a re-up on anti-harassment training. We all know what this is. Um... Well, what normally happens with tr planned training is a classroom, right? And it's probably just the dining room in your restaurant or the home office. The way that people learn is changing. It has changed. The global attention span is sh shrinking. And so when you try to get working people who oftentimes have two, three jobs 
into a seated environment for even more than an hour, knowledge retention is going to plummet. So you have to think about how to deliver that training in a way that increases the uptake, which means that you can't, it can't be sit down, it can't be classroom training. So that's when I talk about access, it's access to really great micro training where people can kind of pick up that knowledge more effectively. I think we try to like dump and run when it comes to knowledge. I'm just going to read through this package with everyone and hope that you learned it. That's just not how people learn. Right, right. One of the favorite stories I like to tell is that, you know, <laughs> we'll talk to a lot of restaurant owners and about how people learn and, and they'll say, you know, like, I just don't understand. Like we did this 60 minute training with everyone and, you know, Judy picked up on it perfectly, but Jose is still struggling, but Jose is really smart. It's like, well, it's not a matter of smart or not smart. And it's not even a matter about learning styles. Like studies show there's no such thing as a learning style. It's really about making sure that you're reinforcing that knowledge. So you had mentioned coaching, right? So what's happening is there's no data, there's no like tracking behind those coaching moments that are actually happening. What's probably happening is that Julie has a manager that's checked in with her that said, hey, I want to check and make sure you actually make this burger properly. Maybe Jose's manager was absent for two weeks or maybe didn't, doesn't know how to coach. So you have to find ways to not only present that information and practice it, but also be able to produce it and get feedback on it. So it's not just about the classroom. It's about what happens outside of the classroom in order to reinforce it. Right, right. And, and so when you say pedagogy, what, what do you mean by that? Like Ped that there's, you said there's two, like, two parts to it. Oh, yeah. So, so the first part is the, play, is the pedagogical nature. Which means what? It means how you teach, how you deliver learning. Okay. <clears throat> okay. But the other side of training that I think is not, really addressed is accessibility and inclusivity. And I mean it not from, frankly, like, yes, there's the diversity, equity, inclusion aspect, but it's also just straight up, okay, let's say you have a thousand employees, 50% of them don't speak English, uh, maybe 5% have trouble reading, a, you have like 3% who are visually impaired. Like inclusivity is about making sure that your knowledge can reach your people in any way that's comfortable for them. Right. So you have to make sure that your training is delivered in multiple languages. You have mm -hmm. to make sure that it's delivered not just over like a big block of text, but you have visuals that accompany it. It's about accommodating the way that people take in information, which these days, like, I don't know about you, but like the way that I learn just day to day, and it's kind of unconscious, is through YouTube videos and mm -hmm. TikTok and Netflix and you know, picking up an article here and there, that's how people are taking in information is videos and um, kind of audiovisual experiences. Yeah, yeah. You know, and when you and I first met, you used this term, the thinning American workforce. And you, you yeah. were talking about that. And and we all know that the, the labor crisis isn't just about the fact that, you know, I, I met someone recently who said they have a theory people don't want to work in restaurants anymore. So it's not just about the fact that we need to change and reinvent the way restaurant culture is shaped and, and how it's delivered and how we manage, but it's also, there's a whole demographic phenomenon, <laughs> I will call it happening, which you're touching on now, which is the next generation, the current generation of workers, what they expect, how they learn. You know, you reminded me, my son, who's now, you know, a musician, pretty much taught himself how to do it all on YouTube. You know, yep. and um, I hear people learning and teaching themselves how to do things on TikTok. 100%. And so um, before we kind of dive into that, though, I'd, I'd love for you to tell our listeners a little bit more about you in terms of I mean, you've obviously amassed a lot of knowledge around training in restaurants. And I know your background, like you worked at Union Square Hospitality, you worked at another restaurant um, in New York City. And you also have this sort of tech HR. I think one of your roles was in HR and people at Union Square. So, so, so tell me how you, you, like, first of all, your experience there and then how that's contributing to what you're doing now at Opus. Yeah, so I'll tell you the, the quick story here. I spent 13 years in the restaurant industry. My, my dad was in manufacturing. My mom is still in food service. My grandpa owned a barbecue chain in Kansas City called Don's World of Beef. 
Mm -hmm. I spent my entire life in these jobs and I spent my entire life trying to get out of these jobs. But then when I moved to New York uh, 10 years ago and I was officially in a buying position, I was a GM, I was an operator, I was a VP of operations. I saw the other side, which was that there were really no tools for my team. I was hiring 300 people to open up a title at the Whitney Museum at USHG. And there was no tools to get people up the curve quickly. And so quit (laughs) in order to solve solve the problem. I'm not an engineer, but um, I just got, you know, and I was there for for several years, but I I was building the business underneath that umbrella. But my point is, is is like, it's such a burning problem. There's 110 million American workers who do not sit at a desk all day. That's 70% of Americans. Yeah. Yeah. And the restaurant industry is for, is what 14 million workers. That's a, a a huge percentage of that. But also think about outside the industry. Like there's a as a big migration from restaurants into manufacturing right now. Manufacturing has 12 million employees. So we're starting with restaurants because that's my background. But the pain point is the same regardless of what industry you're speaking to. Right. And here's the key point to remember. So yes, I, I worked in HR for a while. At Opus, we're actually working directly with COOs and CTOs and CFOs. Training, uh, statistically speaking, training is very quickly becoming an ops game. It's no longer an HR game. Because Mm. when you think about, and listen, like all my friends are in HR, so it's not a knock on HR, but think about what's happening in restaurants right now. It's increasingly litigious. We've seen lawsuit after lawsuit. HR is bogged down with COVID regulations. Like that's the role of HR is compliance. If you are also a people operator, and if you're thinking about culture, right, there's that whole other aspect to be thinking about. But training actually leads to operational efficiency, which is why um, we continue to see training reporting directly into operations now versus where it was a decade ago, which was like kind of nice to have. (laughs) Really, it's critical now. Like ask any restaurant operator, they're struggling right now with getting their people up the productivity curve. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. It's no longer an HR game. I wrote that down. It's an ops game. (laughs) It's an ops game. So... And, and and talking about like seeing your teams not having the tools to get up the curve quickly. Yeah. I got to think that resonates with a lot of people. So tell us how Opus does that and how you're, how you're changing that. So one of my favorite stories to tell is, is what I'll start with here. And, and then, I'll, you know, high level, just so you know what Opus does. Opus is a mobile first or mobile technology that helps deliver planned and responsive training to frontline teams. What's happening every morning (laughs) is that, you know, employees, managers, COOs are waking up and they're using the most sophisticated technology on the planet, their smartphone. And then they go to work and they go through that door and they turn on their computer or they turn on the POS system and they're using something from 1991. So it's no wonder that operators are not investing in these like legacy learning management systems. They're all transitioning to more sophisticated technology, but training has sort of been left behind. It's two decades behind. A lot of the businesses that we're talking to, uh, in fact, 70% of our customer base right now at Opus is transitioning from nothing. And you ask these people, well, why did you never have a system to begin with? Like, well, why now? They wanted something. There was nothing built for their team. So it didn't make sense to invest. Restaurant operators are looking for something that can reach their people. But why would you invest all of that money if you know it's only going to reach the 10 people in the home office? So right. Opus is a technology that helps you build a lesson in 9.8 minutes. I'm not kidding. Distribute it to your team. We, we prioritized building content quickly because that's a huge pain point. You can deliver that lesson out to 100% of your workforce quickly and get data and frontline business intelligence on how people are effectively learning that new knowledge. Wow. At the same time, you can engage your managers in the process. So managers get an app too. So they can track their people. They can have live coaching moments with their people. They can even send them a video. Hey, here's the new menu item. Ship it out to 100% of their people at their location. 
and it's auto captioned, auto subtitled, and they get read receipts on that message. So they know instantly how effectively their team learned that new information. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So I, I have a million questions. What you just said. <laughs> First of all, is it is it iPhone and Android compatible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And tablet. And tablet. Okay. Yeah. Nine point eight minutes to build content. Okay, I could use that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you using? Is it voice enabled? How are people able to build whole lessons or training in nine point eight? So a couple of ways. Did I say it right? Nine minutes? Nine, nine minutes? 9.8 nine eight minutes. Yeah, that, the, we, yeah. we always try to shave down the seconds there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you talk to operators, they'll talk about like an LTO training or a new menu training and it took 30 days to make it. And, right. right? It's insane. And a lot of that goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is that I think a lot of people, you, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is right. about getting content out to your team and getting feedback from your team. So the beauty of Opus is that you ship that quickly and you can actually get scores from your team on how well they liked the training. So you can even improve how you're building your content, right? This is about okay. a, a nice virtuous cycle. Right. But here's how it's built. We built a collaborative course authoring tool. It's multiplayer. It's multilingual. It's approachable for anyone to be able to build it. Like we've seen... The levels of people building an Opus really ranges. Only 15% of our customers, and we work with large organizations, have a training manager. Most people who are building is like, it could be the CEO, it could be Jen in marketing, it could be, um, you know, Joe in operations. And you have to build something that's easy for anyone, even if they're not an instructional designer, which most people aren't. Right. Right. But the other side of it is that we built a content marketplace where you can get free templates, content that's created by experts. So like we partner with um, a company called Allertrain and they deliver allergen safety training through our platform. So you kind of get a one-stop shop for any sort of regulatory training that you need as well. Okay. Okay. So it's not, it's not voice enabled. Is that what I heard? So what do you mean by voice enabled? Like you could actually use the app to create training by talking to it, just like I do mm -hmm. with Siri. So you can do that on the manager app. Okay. So there's two ways that you can create content. One is uh -huh. through the content builder on the desktop computer, and one is through the mobile app. And that's really where that responsive training comes in. And that's basically okay. like, think of about like a TikTok video okay. uh, where you kind yeah. of show, yeah. do a FaceTime video, and then it yeah. can be automatically delivered out to your team. Okay. Okay. So you have a voice enabled component of it. How has it been received? Curious. Well, we've never lost a customer. So okay. I think that's a good sign. <laughs> and how many years have you been in business? We've been in business since 2017. So just to a little bit of backstory on Opus and why we're special. The first iteration of Opus was a company call, I built called ESL Works. Mm -hmm. Our very first use case was delivering English training to smartphones. And listen, if you can solve training for restaurants and solve training for non-English speaking employees in restaurants, you can literally solve for everything. <laughs> so um, we focused on that problem for a little over two and a half years. And then we expanded to include all types of use cases and really help restaurants cover the whole employee life cycle. Okay. And you mentioned you have this big repository of stuff. You yeah. know, so I'm assuming these are best practices honed over some years of every type of training a restaurant operator, regardless of size, could use. Yeah. Is that yeah. a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah. And, and really the types of customers that are going to be most successfully using any sort of digital platform for training are, are usually restaurants that have more than 150 people, because at that point you're starting to scale and really need you know, right. data on that distribution, right? Like a, a smaller mom and pop, I'll, I'll just say it right now, like you probably don't need anything digital, you're good. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you just have one location or two locations, you're saying. You're yeah. probably fine. Yeah. So we work with yeah. multi-unit groups that need to scale their training. Right. And do you differentiate between concept types? Like, do you have different training customized for I'm a fast casual versus a QSR versus fine dining versus pizza and delivery? No. No, because really 
about 80% of training is replicable across all of the industry and about 20% needs to be curated to your specific operation. So, you know, if you're working with Just Salad, which is one of our customers, you know, they might have a specific standard operating procedure around the cash register. Well, that's a template we have and they can kind of adjust it to their needs. But everyone has some sort of cash handling policy or credit card handling policy they need to address. And so the templates can help across all segments of the industry. And then that last 20 percent that usually people build from scratch is anything brand related. It's all going to be bespoke to your leadership style, how you like to deliver content. So the 20 percent is about maybe the mission, the vision of the company. Yeah, yeah, it could be. It, it really ranges on like what is most important to your company. Like, you know, and pizza is very values driven. And so a lot of like that upfront training is getting people to understand the ethos and the culture of what it means to work at and pizza. And then, you know, the next course is how to make the perfect dough. So, right. <laughs> um, you know, so but they do dough. And to your point, Jen. Yeah. They're making pizza, right? And Just Salad is making salad. So we don't have a specific template for yeah. how to make the perfect salad, but we have yeah. uh, a deep understanding of how to procedurally train people in different ways. And so we mm -hmm. can provide a template to get you started uh, so you can kind of fill in the blanks. And that how to train, the template that you have about how to train people in procedural ways, that is my understanding of what you're saying, replicatable. Yeah. Has that proven to, to improve employee retention and engagement? Great question. So the outcome of training and like for anyone who's listening here, whether you're on Opus or another platform, we should always be thinking about how training can impact our business in that it can get people through the door. It can get people up the productivity curve quickly and can get people to stay. Um, and so, listen, like restaurants are a high turnover industry. There's no single platform that's going to completely wash away the turnover issue because, frankly, like it's kind of ingrained in restaurants. We pay low rates. We hire a lot of young people that are kind of transitory, you know, X, Y, Z. But Opus has been shown to um, significantly decrease unnecessary labor costs right now. A business with a thousand employees that's delivering even like an annual required training. Let's say it's like anti-harassment training. I'm going to do some quick math. Let's say, so it's an hour and a half of training per year, a thousand employees. And let's say you're paying $15 an hour. You're already paying $22,000 just in additional labor costs to deliver that training. And that's me being very generous or like not being very, not thinking about it. Right to create the content, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, these are very costly. And so the business output is, okay, I'm going to help my people stay on the floor so they can train in micro moments, learn that knowledge really fast. And then the magic moment is, how special is it that literally when you're walking through the door on day zero, you can scan into an app and you feel taken care of and it's automated. It says, hey, Jen, welcome to, you know, Joe's Cafe here's your day one training. Opus tells you, here's this moment when you need to check in with your manager because they're going to make sure you're answering phones properly or whatever. And you're kind of guided through with this training companion that makes you feel like you're taken care of. Managers are doing so much with so little right now. Like I'm talking to, to GMs who are overseeing five locations. That's insane. But it's the way the restaurant industry is going. We're talking about thinning workforce. So managers are doing more with less. They care about their people, but it's no wonder that people are leaving their jobs if they're not trained from day one. So Opus can supplement a lot of what managers are having a, a hard time managing right now. And that, of course, um, kind of naturally leads to people staying in their job longer. Right, right. Well, that's that's cool. So, I mean, so many things you said resonate. It's never, there's no panacea, right? It's never, there's never going to be like one technology that's yes. going to cure any aspect of the difficulties that are in the restaurant industry today, yeah. mainly this, you know, labor issue and, and retaining employees, but it can help on the cost side, which by the way, is incredibly important to operators who have 
very squeezed thin margins. So that's great to know. And, you know, you also talked about, I mean, you touched on a lot of different things there that I think are interesting, but I'd, I'd love to hear from you where you sit on this theory of people just don't want to work in restaurants anymore. Yeah. Because you started out saying like my whole family, I've got, you know, I've been in the business my whole life. And then you were like, and I tried to get out of it, you know, yeah. where do you think that has come from and where can we go from here? Lee, when we talk about reinventing restaurants, where, how do we make it a place that not everyone, but the people that are eligible and, and good fits for that type of work want to work there? So you're saying how can businesses be become employers of choice, basically? Yeah, restaurants. Restaurants. Yeah. Oh, man, that's the million-dollar question. Make it more question. attractive. Make yeah. it more attractive. I mean, I'm biased, but I think great yeah. training. But, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously. But when we're thinking about being, well, let's talk facts for a minute. We are mm -hmm. in the most competitive labor market in U.S. history. Okay, yeah. Worker pay rates are well above pre-pandemic trends. We know historically that those are, un, are will not lower again. They're just going to keep going. They're 4% above the trend. Um, and frontline workers have more power than they ever have. And so as we're thinking, of, as business owners, as we're thinking about how we can position ourselves so that people come to us, it's really about thinking about how you can cater to four generations of workers. I think that's the secret here is I see a lot of employers think about, okay, how can we attract um, employees and they're only focused on young employees or they're only focused on millennials. You have to have a message that can cross all generations. And so think about like how training can do that too. Again, I'm biased, but your approach should be adults. It should address adult problems. Talk about the benefits that you're offering. Talk about maternity leave if you can. Talk about flexible schedules and commutes. Talk about the fact that, you know, you you want to receive employee feedback in order to be a better employer. This is where we're headed with the next generation of work, especially as workers have more power. Gone are the days of like, okay, well, we can have a revolving door. That's okay. We're going to kind of work it into the budget. It's just not really an option. Like people are leaving the restaurant industry and they're not coming back. And so that's why, Jen, when you and I were talking, it's like, it's really about how businesses can do more with less, but it's also about how you can identify those high potential employees and keep them and really support them in being career level restaurant employees, which means great benefits and great training. And, you know, you talk about the four generations of workers. I mean, I heard someone use this term zillennials. I don't know if you, you've heard oh, that no. term, but it's like no, I get it's it. Gen, yeah. Gen Z and the millennials, right? And so you've got the zillennials, you've got the Gen X, you've got the boomers, right? And, and you talk about your training and using this, this smartphone approach and this digital first, you know, training approach. At what point do people sort of tap out with it? Because I know myself, you know, I'm on screens all the time. I'm looking at the screens all the time. I've done the anti-harassment training, which it was micro chunked out, you know, into 20 minute pieces, but even that felt long. So how do you cater to folks that may, even if it's not a generational thing, like they want a blend of, you know, the in-person on the job training and in the restaurant and some of the digital? Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what. Opus does. I sound like a broken record, but like when I say that we meet people where they are, I say that because we're reflecting the reality of how training is actually happening. We're not trying to create a new innovative type of training. We're trying to reflect what's actually happening on the job and then capture that data really beautifully. But I think like the dirty little secret about any great training program, whether it's online or on paper or whatever, is just treat people like adults. <laughs> like, let them make mistakes. Don't require 100% accuracy on a quiz. Don't require that somebody have to watch 100% of a video. Like, okay, if I've watched, in Jen, you were talking about anti-harassment training, like, just mandating that somebody watch a video does not lead to better learning outcomes. It's about, okay, I watched this video. Now I'm going to discuss it. Um, mm -hmm. There's a term in training that everyone should know and not enough people know. It's called PPP. Do you know what that stands for? No. 
PPP stands for present, practice, produce. Okay. So no matter what, let's say you're doing a new menu training. Mm -hmm. Anybody walking away from this podcast right now, I want you to think about how if you're doing a new menu training, how are you presenting that information? Is it a video? Is it just like a quick stand-up meeting? Is it a piece of paper with a recipe? Mm -hmm. How are they practicing it? Mm -hmm. So are they taking a quick quiz? What have you? Are they talking to a friend about it? Are they taking a photo? And how are they producing it? So are they mm -hmm. making the product? Are they talking about the product? Uh, like pitching it? Are they selling wine? What have you? Those three elements lead to extremely high levels of knowledge retention. And so as long as we're always thinking about that curve, we can be in ensure that we're engaging our people the whole way through. If you only have one of those P's the whole time, like a lecture is just present, right? Right. If you're just giving somebody a quiz and they've never actually learned anything, mm -hmm. or if you're just telling them like, go sit at the fryer and make these fries, and they've never actually done the previous two steps, then they're not going to be successful in their job. So as long mm -hmm. as PPP is worked into everything that you're doing from an operational standpoint, you're going to have higher output and happier people. Mm, that's great. Present, practice, produce. Exactly. And it sounds like you have the data too on the production side. So you can right. actually monitor if they are producing. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And talk to me a little bit more about the the practicing. I mean, how much do you have data on how much people need to do, you know, something like I, I've heard in the past, it takes 30 days to learn a new habit. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, in terms of, of the practice element, is that important? I'm, I'm sure it differs per person. It definitely differs per person, but there are some facts, right? Like you can mm -hmm. only retain three pieces of information for every 90 minutes of presentation. Okay. And but there's also tactics you can use so that people remember, right? Like I just taught you PPP. So acronyms work and little little isms to help people remember visuals considerably increase people's uptake with learning. Repetition is important. So you can't just expect somebody to learn something in three minutes. You have to kind of reiterate that. So there's no real hard and fast like everybody's going to learn this thing because you did that, I think what's most important is to make sure that you're reinforcing it. At the end of the day, we are a people business and we're a hands-on business. So yeah. if you're just expecting people to read a packet and be successful in their first day, it's going to be a challenge to get them up the curve. But if you have a system by which they are being visually verified by a manager and a skill on each shift as they're let's say a new hire, um, the likelihood that they're going to learn that knowledge is much higher. So make sure that there's a people component or a coach, excuse me, a coaching component to learning. And, and I, I don't think it has to be super scientific. We certainly have our methodology, but mm -hmm. overall, you know, you and I both worked in, in the industry. Like it, it's mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's about the people connection that you're making and and then the, the business level is just making sure that you're capturing that data so you know what's working and what's not. Yeah. How many users are on the platform? Uh, so we don't share user numbers, but we are in all 50 states. So we're focused on uh, the U.S. and Canada right now. We mm -hmm. work with multi-unit groups with between 10 and 100 locations, just to give you a sense of our, our customer base. And yeah. we also work You with go over 100 locations? Yeah, like we work with with companies, very, very large companies as well mm -hmm. on a select basis. We're actually pretty um, choosy about the customers we work with. Um, we want to work okay. with folks who are mission aligned, who are interested in investing in their training and operationalizing their workforce. So with which with larger companies with, say, like 200,000 employees, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how they're how we can really impact their bottom line and what sort of business outcomes they're looking to improve. Mm -hmm. So you will work with like a thousand unit chain, but they have to be super aligned with yeah. your, your mission, your vision. They have to have the resources on their side to commit, I suppose, to the training. Yeah, it's less about resources. It's more, you can talk to, um, I remember having this conversation with um, Michael Astoria and Pizza. Mm -hmm. He was like, I've never, yeah. had, I never had a conversation where I, the customer, was being vetted before. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah, yeah. We're, and we're not mean about it or anything, but we yeah. ask qualifying yeah. questions. Like, we want to make, yeah. listen, like, 
And we will also be honest with you if we feel like Opus is not a great fit. And we'll say, hey, like, listen, it's probably best that you use one of these legacy systems or you should stick with paper for now. So we need like, more of that in this industry, by the way. Because <laughs> we do the same thing and we've been told also, thank you. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, don't you know. buy it if you don't need it. And and our sales team is trained very well to be thoughtful. And then, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes people are too small and we'll say, hey, come back when you're ready. We're not going anywhere. And and we're happy to yeah. give you resources in the meantime. We have a great, great resources on our website for better training. We have a huge community of about 5,000 training managers, operators that we just share resources with who are, who are deeply invested in their people and training their people. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, sorry, I cut you off. You were talking about you were talking to Michael Astoria. So, what were the questions like you were asking him? If it's not about oh. resource, yeah. So, um, the very first question we ask on a call is is simple. It's tell me about your training program. Tell me what's working. Tell me what's not. We don't know what you're using. We don't ask uh, if you're using a legacy system. We don't ask if you're, you know, like what's, what's, what other companies are you talking to? It's really about like, how do you think about training? Like, we had a great call the other day with a, a large employer, QSR. And I just remember him using the term blended learning. And so we listen for these key words. Uh, do you know what blended learning is? I've heard of it. I have an idea what it is, but go ahead and for for everyone explain. So blended it. learning is where essentially where you combine technology with in-person training. Okay. It's exactly oh. what we do at Opus. We're not trying to eliminate humans. Your managers are great trainers, right. but we want right. to save them time and capture the data, right? right? Right. And he was like, Ma, I'm obsessed with blended learning and how I yeah. can incorporate more of those those people moments. And that mm-hmm. was like the box that we right. checked. We're like, this is great. You're, this is how you're thinking about yeah. it. Some of the yeah. things, it's probably more interesting to talk about what disqualifies people. So yeah. if a business will come to us and they'll say, hey, you know, like we're interested in a program that is fully gamified. And by gamified, it's like everything is turned into a game and there's points and there's leaderboards. We have that too, but the method is not gamified. There's a lot of studies that show that gamification does not yield higher learning outcomes. And we're really serious about taking a meaningful approach to training. I think gamification is a proxy for bad engagement. So we do things that make learning fun and interesting, but we're not going to just say like, well, you got five points, Jen, because you finished this lesson. You know what it should lead to? It's uh, finishing a course should lead to you having more access to economic opportunity. So like, we're thinking about ways that you can build work value throughout your life. And so we're, we're asking those questions. And if you want something that's real quick, games and things like that, and we'll refer you to a couple of fun platforms that we love, like Kahoot is awesome, things like yeah. that. But I that. yeah, I like, I'm obsessed with them. But you get my point. It's like, we're really interested in the future of learning at work and like to partner with companies that are thinking about it too and want to do something yeah. and interesting. No, no, I really appreciate that. I mean, like I said, and it is a soapbox for me. I don't want to get on it too much, but this industry, and and I always feel bad for the restaurants and the buyers on the restaurant side. They've been shoved so much stuff that I don't think they need, particularly from tech companies. But, you know, I go to these conferences all the time and you see it. Everyone's got a next shinier widget than the next person, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so much just stuff out there. I mean, you look at that technology ecosystem chart and the hundreds and thousands of different systems. And I think, wow, I'm so glad I'm not on the restaurant buying side, you know, mm-hmm. and how dated the whole process is when you go to these, you know, I call them like dog and pony shows almost like these conferences, you know, where people are literally, you know, I was just at NRA and it, I had someone almost grab me and pull me into their booth to sell me like a heater, yeah. <laughs> you know, it keeps food warm. I'm like, no, oh, one like you know? you. yeah, no, one yeah like- but what you're describing is a challenger sale. We, we, we do that here. We call it chat. But we, we need to be more authentic and real and honest with people about what they need. And, and when you start talking about the gamification, it does. It sounds like the, a shiny widget. And they're like, oh, I heard X, Y, and Z restaurant over here got gamification and their employees love it. So I'm going to go get gamification. And what you're talking about is a much more thoughtful and intentional approach to your business. 
Yeah. And maybe that's where we're going in restaurants is them adopting, you know, <laughs> the classic like more bi business savvy learning, right? And systems and strategy. Because because like you said, your first question is, what is your training approach? What is your strategy? And you're trying to discern what is their thinking? How are they prioritizing it, right? And that's what we do. And you mentioned the legacy nature of, of it all. And you mentioned that, you know, training around the cash register and, and you know, all the legacy. So, like, fine, go use Aloha, whatever you want to use. Like, we will recommend other systems. If it's a smaller company, we'll recommend Toast, you know. Like, but what we really care about is the process and the strategy. We want to make your ordering easier. Yes, of course, for your guests. But mainly, first and foremost, for your people, your yeah. your uh, your people working there, it's got to be easy for them. Exactly. Um, so that's where the efficiency comes in. That's where it's going to help with labor and and the thinning workforce. And so that was one question I was thinking: How do you work with all these other systems that are in the restaurant ecosystem? Do you do you need to integrate with POSs or not? Yeah. You don't have to. Uh, we integrate okay. with, with 26 different platforms right now, but it's not okay. required. But, so you know, like, integrated solution. Yeah, like it can really plug and play. And we kind of purposely built it for that way that the restaurant tech ecosystem is massive. And there's some platforms that have to integrate with 100% of your systems, like the, the CRMs and the marketing intelligence tools. Like you just have to be a part of all of these things. With training, it's not a requirement. We like to do it to make things a little bit simpler for people. So we integrate yeah. with UKG and ADP and all of kind of the, the standard people management platforms. Mm -hmm. And you can probably guess why. It makes it easy that when you hire that person, they're automatically in their training. And then when they leave, right. they no longer have access to it. Right, right. Okay, cool. Well, as we wrap here, Rachel, first of all, I want to just really thank you for your time and, and appreciate all of your insight and all the wisdom you have around training. It's it's clear you you know, you know what you're doing. Promo for your company, <laughs> already wisdom for, you know, folks trying to really deal with and grapple this whole idea of how do I quickly implement a training system that's not going to cost me an arm and a leg? Like, yeah, what are your parting thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, so, you know, Feel free to reach out if you want to learn a little bit more about Opus or if you're just curious to learn about ways that you can improve training at your own company. We're, we're an open book and we, we love talking to people. We co-built Opus with the industry. So a lot of what you're seeing come through is built in partnership with our customers. Um, and, and all of them will tell you that anytime we release a new feature, the first thing we want is their feedback. And Oftentimes we're releasing a feature, it's because they gave us that feedback. So yeah, I, I think like at Opus, if you want to join our community, uh, you can go to www.opus.so. You can learn about our community called Opera. If you don't know what Opus stands for, Opus means a life's work. Opera is the plural of Opus. It's when many voices come together. And so we just like to bring folks together and, and think about new ways to innovate at work, especially when it comes to the majority of our people. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn. We have a vicious LinkedIn following. So if you're a LinkedIn <laughs> person, um, and we're very opinionated. So if you yeah. want to learn a little bit more there, uh, feel free to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, all of the, yeah. all of the socials. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I did have this one other question about the, uh, the training aspect, because I've heard this also is, you know, because the parting thought I'm having is it all comes back to investing in your people, right? Yeah, it does. We need to double down on our people. And that includes our training foremost. What about, and you mentioned, so what should be the outcome of them getting the training? It's they have more opportunity, economic opportunities. There's also been a miss around educating people. Do you have access to other like career development resources through Opus? Through Opus? Like leadership. Could training? I go on? Yeah. Could I go in and learn other people besides? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A thousand percent. So like lifelong learning, things that can yeah. help you develop those skills. Yeah. 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 And that's a really okay. important aspect of that's one of those use cases that's important. A lot of the thing, one thing that employers ask us about a lot is, hey, you know, I want to spot potential promotions, but yeah. sometimes you want to see if people are taking initiative. So 
what we're thinking about next at Opus is ways that you can give people access to like lifelong learning opportunities and things that they can do outside of the required training. So you can yeah. kind of spot that people are taking initiative. Oh, I just saw that Julia, who's a line cook, wanted to learn about bartending. So mm. she like took a course. It's mm. and I we could talk a whole other hour about cross training, but the amount of conversations I've been having with restaurant employers about how critical cross training their people is right now, especially with labor shortages, it's just what's next. And so all of that to say is yes. <laughs> yes. Invest in your people. Invest in your Continue people. Continue re reinventing the restaurants and get in touch with Rachel at Opus. Yeah. If you really want to get serious about training. So yeah, love thank talk. you so much for for being a trailblazer in our industry and 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 helping us all be better and do better. And and thanks for joining us on Restaurants Reinvented. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate your time. Thank you for checking out this episode of Restaurants Reinvented. This show is brought to you by Q, a restaurant tech company paving a brighter future for operators with the industry's first unified commerce platform. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow Restaurants Reinvented in your favorite podcast app or visit qbeyond.com slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.